Hello, welcome to the webinar in the Asian Carp Canada series. My name is Christine Pinckney and I'm the Asian Carp Project Officer here at the Invasive Species Centre. The Invasive Species Centre is a non-for-profit uh, partnership that builds, identifies priorities and supports projects to protect Canada's environment from damaging effects of invasive species. We also work to connect stakeholders, knowledge and technology to prevent and reduce the spread of invasive species that can harm Canada's environment, economy, and the society. Uh, the Invasive Species Centre has collaborated with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada to develop the Asian Carp Canada project. And this project includes these series of webinars uh, focusing on the issues surrounding Asian carps. So before we start today, I'd just like to let you know that all participants are, will be muted during the broadcast. And after the presentation, we, there will be a brief question and answer period. If you wish, wish to ask a question, please type it into the question box during the webinar, and our presenter will try to answer as many questions as he can with the time remaining. This webinar will be recorded and will also be available for viewing on our website at asiancarp.ca. So today I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Chris Wilson. Chris is a research scientist with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and he runs the province's Aquatic Biodiversity and Conservation Research Unit at Trent University. He also oversees the ministry's fisheries genetics lab and the provincial research hatchery. Chris's research, research focuses primarily on the spatial genetic structure and biodiversity of exploited and endangered aquatic species and using this information to help inform their sustainable management. His research also involves the use of environmental DNA screening and using this to help search for Asian carps in Ontario waters of the Great Lakes as part of Ontario's surveillance efforts. Today, Chris will discuss how early detection of aquatic invasive species is essential for developing and implementing rapid response strategies. He will also describe how environmental DNA detection can be used for this early detection and how it can be especially valuable in detecting Asian carps. Chris, I'm going to pass the presentation over to you and give you control of the mouse. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, well, um, first off, welcome everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, today's talk is a bit more technical than the previous ones in the Asian carp series. I'm going to talk about environmental DNA in terms of what it is, how it's useful for looking for Asian carp and other aquatic invasive species, and what we found. Once I remember how to drive the mouse. So, <clears throat> uh-oh. Christine, could you back me up a slide, please? Thank you. So this is the future we want to avoid. And the first thing to say about this photo is this is not a photograph from Ontario. Uh, this was provided courtesy of the uh, Department of Natural Resources in Minnesota. And this is showing three, spe three of the four species of Asian carp that we would really prefer not show up here. So from left to right, uh, they're holding the black carp, silver carp, and big head carp. And the other point to make here is by the time a species is abundant enough to be able to catch using approaches like commercial harvest, they're probably well established and this is exactly what we want to prevent. So the, the most effective step for invasive species is prevent their arrival in the first place. If they do arrive, it's very important to identify that they're present early on while they're still in low enough numbers that eradication or control efforts have a chance to be effective. If they do become established, it gets much more difficult for dealing with them. So the key is identify them early on to be able to respond quickly and effectively. Now, some of the key uh, challenges are finding where they are and when they appear. So the questions seem fairly simple in terms of, well, who's where, how many are there, where are they occurring? Answering them can be quite a bit more challenging. So to start off, where do you look? We need a way to be able to find fish at low numbers, find out what habitats they're using, and identify, ideally also identify where it is they're coming in from and what are their invasion or expansion routes. 
so that we can basically block these off and prevent any more invasion. And also, be very useful to have a tool to be able to do follow-up eval evaluation of management or control efforts to be able to see how effective the different response efforts are. And this is where environmental DNA comes in. So all it is, in environmental DNA or eDNA, which I will probably be referring to it as eDNA for the rest of the talk, all it really is is cells or DNA that have been shed from organisms into the surrounding environment. So this can be a living or a dead source. It's just sloughing off cells, tissue, potentially raw DNA itself. It can come from all sorts of different body parts or fluids. What it cannot tell us is the age or size or sex of the fish, anything really about the population. But what it can say is if we're able to detect DNA from a species, there's a decent likelihood that a member of that species was present at that sampled location at the time we did this. And uh, the best analogy people have come up with today to really a molecular smoke alarm. If you have a smoke alarm in your house, most of the time it's not a lot to be worried about, but it's there for emergencies. So if it goes off, it's a question of is, have you burned your toast or is your house on fire? Regardless of which it is, you want to look because there's a high risk. And this is what eDNA allows us to do, is basically identify that risk and then do follow-up sampling. So what we use for this, and we is not just my lab, there's a num number of um, agency and academic labs using environmental DNA. So far, the, the best resource for this is mitochondrial DNA, that it's a heritable information molecule. Uh, mitochondria are in every cell in your body, and this is true for all living organisms, that uh, mitochondria are essentially the energy source for a cell, and they carry their own DNA genome in it, which is this graphic on, on the lower right. So mitochondria are inherited from the mother in the egg. It's a small genome, simple to work with, and it's very useful for species identification. But, uh, there, there's a global effort called the Barcode of Life, being led by the University of Guelph, with the aim of identifying all living species on the planet based on one gene in the mitochondrial genome, which I've highlighted as the barcoding gene. Uh, the short name for it is just CO1. Don't really need to get into details on it. But to work with this, it's basically we develop markers to target a portion of that particular CO1 gene and then we make literally billions of copies from this using the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And this is about as technical as I'll get for the rest of the talk. So the polymerase chain reaction allows us to basically replicate DNA duplication in cells, but instead of going for your whole genome, it's identifying a small, simple fragment. And through a series of chemical reactions, we can basically make billions of copies of that small segment of DNA. And for environmental DNA, we're typically targeting very short such sections of DNA from 70 to about 300 bases or nucleotides in length. So this method allows us to identify small numbers of a target DNA and make large uh, working copies. It's a very sensitive technique. Uh, forensic science also relies on this. And like forensic science, it's very important to validate your tool before running out and applying it. So as I mentioned, there's this barcode of life uh, global effort. One of the products from this has been a global database. And with this, they've cataloged sequences for this particular gene for about half a million species living today so far. And it's a wonderful resource for developing environmental DNA detection because you can go to that database, look for the species you're interested in, extract the sequence information, and design your primers or markers to identify it from that. And fortunately for Asian carp, one of the first products from this barcoding initiative was a catalog of all freshwater species in Canada, native and otherwise. And it makes it a wonderful resource for dialing in, finding the sequence for a species we want, in this case Asian carp, and designing the markers that allow us to, to target that DNA specifically. So not going into detail here, but essentially, from this database, we can design these species-specific primers or markers that allow us to make copies 
only of the species we're interested in and ignores anything else that's present in that environmental sample. And a step from this, once you identify this, you then want to test out your tool and make sure it's working properly. So to do this, uh, I oversee two facilities. One is a DNA lab at Trent University. The other is Ontario's Research Hatchery. And my lab was able to use this as a test facility because we, had, we know what species are there, where they are, the biomass of each. And it enabled us to do testing on how sensitive and how specific are these detection tools. Can we find one species and only one, ignoring all others present? Is, how sensitive is eDNA detection to where your source is? Or how numerous your source is in terms of biomass? And also, once an organism has moved on, how long does that signal remain in the environment saying that it was there? So this was done under controlled conditions, but it allows us to test these different parameters. So as an example, uh, here's an overhead shot of the facility. We were able to sample its water inflow with this very fancy high-tech equipment, which is our Mars rover, uh, sample the water coming into the facility, coming out of the facility, and different distances downstream and then see from this, where do we find the DNA? Now first, when we extract DNA from the water itself, there's an astonishing amount of DNA present in what looks like crystal clear water. But the image on the upper left of this slide, this shows a typical DNA gel. And those dark bands right across the top, those are the amounts of DNA that were present in water samples uh, that has been repeatedly tested and is safe to drink looks gorgeous, but we get startling amounts of DNA from it, enough that we actually had to dilute the DNA before we started testing for the species we want to find. So this shows one example. In this case, this is DNA from brook trout that are held at the facility. And you can see for the inflow, we don't get any species detection. But immediately downstream of the facility, there's very strong DNA bands. And as we move farther and farther downstream, those bands get fainter until they disappear. So by two kilometers downstream, we no longer have that signal. And what this tells us is when we get detections for the species we're interested in, that signal will be stronger the closer you are to the source. And again, it's very much like the smoke detector in your home. So we have spatial sensitivity. We also tested out how strong is the signal depending on the number of source individuals. And for this, we used uh, juvenile brook trout these are literally called fall fingerlings because they're about the size of your finger. And as we increase the number of individuals in a tank, these very fancy laundry tubs, uh, you can see on the DNA image that the, the signal gets much stronger as we went from 1 to 16 individuals. So what this is telling us is it's not only sensitive to distance from the source, but how strong is the biomass of the source. And lastly, and just briefly, we can also see time patterns that sampling different time intervals after fish have been put into these tanks. Within an hour, we get a very strong detection, and it persists. Rather than showing what happens after, uh, once we've left them in, fish are removed. And here you can see on the image that we can still detect them an hour to two hours after they're no longer present. And this is through a flowing water environment. By four hours, the signal is extremely faint, and we could not detect it after four hours once the individuals had been removed. So based on this, we're pretty confident the tool works. We're able to validate that it's sensitive to individual species, and we can tell distance from source, how strong the source is, and it's sensitive to time since that source is removed. So we're pretty confident about the tool at that point under controlled conditions. But revisiting some of the limitations, this will only say the DNA from the species was present. If we'd run these experiments with dead fish, we would get similar results. So live or dead, we can't say. And the signal strength is really driven by the biomass, how strong your flame is in the smoke detector analogy. We can't say is it one big fish or many small ones. So there's all these different variables going on. We were able to separate them under controlled conditions in the wild, it's going to be more challenging because all of these variables could be at play. And one other thing to point out, I'll be coming back to this, is 
uh, we're relying on being able to amplify DNA from very small starting amounts. So the lab that the work is done in is actually a huge threat to generating false positive results. And I'll come back to this later. So it's not just the lab, it's also the field sampling. And all of the agencies involved in, in Asian carp environmental DNA monitoring are very careful of this. If somebody handles a fish and gets some slime on their waders and then they go into the water, they could be spreading that fish's DNA into the water. And then you're leaning over and sampling. What you're probably detecting is slime off the waders from the fish you were handling 10 minutes earlier. So it's very important to decontaminate all sampling gear once you bring samples into the lab. All steps of the process, again, we, we build in safeguards to make sure that we're not getting false results from contamination. Can't emphasize that enough. So the, the particular species where environmental DNA has really been applied have been the four species of Asian carps. And this is really driven by the expansion of all of the species up the Mississippi River south of the Chicago Shipping Canal. And until recently, it was possible to buy triploid or sterile grass carp for controlling pond weeds, very popular in golf courses, uh, cottagers, et cetera. So there are grass carp in inland lakes in Michigan. There's been documented wild juveniles from Ohio waters of western Lake Erie. And there was a lot of media attention in summer of 2015 when a number of grass carp were caught in Lake Ontario. Uh, thankfully, none of them were reproductive. So this is the paper that started it all. Um, the paper came out in 2011 from the University of Notre Dame. And the important points are summarized on that map. Essentially, the yellow bar, that shows where the electrical barrier preventing Asian carp coming into the Great Lakes is. The red stars show areas where uh, environmental DNA was detected from big head or silver carp. And for several of those sites, after the DNA was reported from that, the US Army Corps of Engineers went in and did sampling, and they were able to find Asian carp. So the concern is this was giving indication that, first off, Asian carp could be getting close to getting into the Great Lakes. And secondly, that environmental DNA was informative on where to find these fish. Now, one other thing to mention from this, there's been intensive efforts looking for actually capturing fish since this paper came out. And to date, nobody has caught big head or silver carp in the Great Lakes. So the early warning system seems to be working. We've yet to catch big head or silver carp since those detections occurred. But the US federal agencies started a very large scale sampling effort in US waters of the Great Lakes. And they did get positive detections of both big head carp and silver carp in tributaries feeding into the western side of Lake Erie. So particularly uh, in Maumee Bay and Sandusky Bay. And th these are illustrated by the green dots on the lower left of the Lake Erie map. So this caused quite a bit of concern. And this is, again, where it's important to flag limitations. Despite intensive looking, people have not caught big head or silver carp in the Great Lakes since that time. So just emphasizing it could be live fish, which is people what people are worried about. The biggest concern would be an established population. But there's many other potential sources. As I've mentioned, dead fish shed DNA very well while they're decomposing. So we could also be able to pick this up from food waste, where it's legal to buy these um, in the food fish markets and consume them. So it's possible we would be detecting is basically sewage outflow. We pretty much eliminated this possibility, but that's, there's not really time to get into that right now. It is possible that fish could be eaten by birds and then the, their remains excreted out. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been testing this, and it is possible. It's also possible that it would be DNA from the water itself and no fish actually being present. Things like um, beet bucket water or discharge of ballast water from a, a cargo ship. So these are all possibilities. The thing is you don't really want to take a risk. 
so our challenge is really discriminating between what is true information and, and what is false. So we really want to avoid false positive and false negative results. Now, uh, this is somewhat difficult to read, but it's from an excellent paper that came out in 2001 that talked about exactly this, different ways of quantifying and detecting both false positive results and false negatives. That with a false positive, basically you don't want to be ringing the fire alarm too many times, or you're unlikely to get an effective response, and you also really call into question the usefulness of your tool. Likewise for false negatives, if something is present, you want to be confident that you have detected it, and basically the battery is still good in your smoke alarm, to keep using that analogy. So for anybody doing environmental DNA, I'd definitely recommend having a look at that paper. Uh, what my lab switched to early on was rather than the normal way of amplifying DNA, we switched to a, a variation of this called quantitative PCR because it allows for more sensitive detection and we can cut down on the rates of both false positive and false negative results. So this is more sensitive than the normal tool for developing. Just for comparison, uh, the images on the left show amplifying uh, known DNA samples, these are our positive controls, at concentrations from 1 million down to one target copy per PCR reaction. So that's the curves on, on the top left as, as well as the linear relationship on the bottom left. And then for comparison on the bottom right, that shows a conventional DNA gel uh, at those same concentrations. And as you can see, as you move over to the right, the signals really start to fade away. So we're confident down to 1,000 copies per reaction detection. By 100, it's getting faint. And below that, you'd need really good eyesight or very strong confidence. But this is where you get into the gray area. So the quantitative PCR <clears throat> excuse me, allows us to be more sensitive, find DNA at lower concentrations. This really cuts down on false negative results. And is also, we have ways of testing to make sure it is a real result that when we've amplified DNA, it is the target we're looking for. So this is one of the big challenges, and it, it's, a, it's a challenge in any diagnostic test, not just environmental DNA. So in my lab, uh, one of my grad students really led the charge on this and adopted some methods from the medical literature to quantify the rate of true and false positive results for both positive and negative. And what it really comes down to is trying to balance the sensitivity and specificity of, of your reaction. Data is data. It's always real. The challenge is interpreting. So being able to establish defensible thresholds. We're saying above this point, yes, the data are real. Below, no, we're confident that this is an absence. Um, basically, there, there's a difference between something is not there and a failure to detect it. So we need this to be able to really have defensible results, have more confidence, to be sure that what we are seeing is real and that our interpretations are correct. So the last of the technical stuff. Um, <clears throat> basically, because we depend on amplifying this DNA or making copies in this chemical reaction, there are environmental chemicals um, like T is a great inhibitor. So it would basically prevent the being able to make copies of DNA. And we have a num number of control methods where we can run through to make sure that we're not the chemical reaction is working as it should. And if DNA is present, we're confident of finding it. Likewise, when we do get uh, a target amplifying, or, or what we refer to as a positive result, we want to make sure that it is real and from an environmental sample, not from the lab. As I mentioned earlier, any DNA lab that does environmental DNA is the single biggest threat to false positives because you work with DNA every day. It's going to be in the lab, potentially on your tools, on the counters, and this whole PCR technology allows us to make many, many copies from a very small starting amount. If you have many copies present, that's a huge risk. So we've developed synthetic positive controls that uh, allow us to safeguard against this. 
and I can explain this to people later if they're interested. For those of you that don't live in the lab, the short version is it works very well. So getting back to sort of the meat in the sandwich, uh, as I mentioned, there, there were these detections on the U.S. side uh, in Ohio, the Maumee and Sandusky River, and this created huge concern. So there's been large-scale sampling from both federal and state agencies in the United States to follow up on this. And likewise, in Ontario, we've been doing some testing. So th this is uh, one snapshot of the U.S. efforts. It was originally led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Since 2013, it's being led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. To give you some idea, in 2014, over 6,000 samples were collected and tested across the Great Lakes Basin, uh, testing just for big head and silver carp, although there is increasing interest in starting to test for grass carp as well. And uh, if people are interested in seeing this in detail or want to find out more about a particular area, the website for this is uh, listed on the bottom of the slide. Um, it's well worth looking at. It's a very well organized effort and they're doing a wonderful job of reporting as well. Now, on the Ontario side, uh, the news about this came to light during the summer of 2012 and Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, sorry, it was old name at the time, uh, launched a bit of a sampling effort using both environmental DNA and also going out with boats and electrofishing for them. And this shows the, the combination of efforts. So in the Western Basin, it was both boats and eDNA. As we move east from the Western Basin, it primarily relied on environmental DNA sampling. So we collected at uh, just under 100 sites, multiple sampling intervals, three samples per site. And thankfully, um, we came up empty. So. Thankfully, we do not have the situation that the folks in Minnesota do. What this image shows is these were the areas that were sampled and tested for environmental DNA, and basically using a stoplight approach, we found nothing. So there were the positive detections on the U.S. side. 2012, there was no evidence of any of the species of Asian carp in Ontario waters. So this was followed up again in 2013. But this was uh, less reactive and more strategic. So instead of just sampling what seemed reasonable, uh, MNRF worked with Department of Fisheries and Oceans to basically do more strategic targeted sampling based on potential spawning rivers in the spring and then summer habitats that would be likely to be used by the three different species. So this is big head, silver, and grass carp. So this was. Uh, sort of a collaborative surveillance effort between the two agencies, expanded sampling, and again, uh, we got no detections during the spring and summer. Then, as a bit of a reality check, uh, the grass carp decided to teach us our limitations, and in 2013, two grass carp were captured in the Grand River in eastern Lake Erie. So the first of these was caught by an angler, and uh, posted on Facebook, which is how it came to uh, our collective notice. The other one was targeted sampling by fisheries and oceans, looking specifically in the lower Grand River, so based on this habitat suitability and risk assessment. So uh, where the environmental DNA was sampled was some distance from where these fish were captured, so this is where the spatial sensitivity kicks in. In the follow-up, we uh, once this area was specifically targeted, there were positive detections briefly uh, for grass carp, and then it faded over time, suggesting that this was just a stray and not representing a population. Now, just briefly mention, I've been talking about Asian carp so far, but environmental DNA works for pretty much any species you're interested in. So my lab uses this for endangered species and documenting habitat occupancy as well. But another invasive species that I wanted to touch on just briefly is an invasive plant. Uh, this one's called the water soldier, which is uh, a very nasty plant you don't really want anywhere near your cottage. That uh, it's, until recently it's been available in pond supply stores, 
there's only one major wild population in North America, and this is in the Trent River in southern Ontario, um, where this plant has become established and is has been spreading quite well. It's able, able to reproduce both sexually and asexually just by budding and growth. So there is a control effort underway. Uh, for right now, the first step is control. Eradication will come later. But environmental uh, DNA is being used to help document where patches of this plant are and can be used to support eradication efforts. So uh, I mentioned I'm at Trent University. There are several faculty here that are also involved in this control effort. Uh, one lab is using a combination of remote sensing for detecting occurrences of the plant and also testing different ways of removing them or killing them. And then I'm working with a plant geneticist, Joanna Freeland at Trent, where we're looking at applying this eDNA surveillance, both to map out their distribution potential dispersal and with the goal of also being able to use this for following up eradication efforts. So it's not fish, but it's fish habitat. And as I mentioned, this can be used for many other species. Um, so my lab has developed detection markers for a little over two dozen invasive species so far and tested it out on a number of these. Uh, basically, we don't want any of these species. Some of them are already here, like round goby, uh, tube-nosed goby. Other ones we uh, have not yet arrived, but we do not want them, like this northern snakehead, the fish pictured in the middle. And again, there are limitations to this method. We've tried them out on some invertebrates and found that they work. But um, in this case, it's more effective to go out with a plankton net. You will get a immediate answer, very inexpensive. Uh, so the environmental DNA will give you information, but it's not always the best tool to reach for. The key for this, though, is this is something where we want to have the tools available in advance. Once a species shows up, you want to be able to respond to it quickly, rapidly, very effectively. That is the key. You need rapid, effective response. And this is why we've developed these detection tools, is if a risk assessment indicates a species is sort of an imminent threat, poised to invade, we want to be ready to be able to go out and detect them, find occurrences while they're still lo at low numbers, while it's hopefully possible to control them and prevent any establishment. So this is a bit of the overview of environmental DNA. Um, sorry for pulling you into the weeds on some points, but one of the really key things from this, first off, it is an effective tool. It allows us to get out and very quickly get a snapshot. Do we see any sign of species that we're concerned about? One big advantage, we don't need to physically capture or encounter the Asian carp themselves or other invasive species. <clears throat> if we can find evidence of their presence from DNA in the water, then we can look at the possible different sources, what it might be, what it is likely to be, and what are we comfortable with or on the flip side, are we uncomfortable enough we want to go out and sample? So what it's really useful for is resolving uncertainty. If the species is already established and abundant, we don't need this tool, we know they're there. If, if we know that they are not present, so for instance, if we want to find polar bears in Lake Erie, I'm fairly sure we won't find any. Again, there's no point testing. So it's really only in that uncertainty where we're not sure, but we're worried that something might be present. That is where the tool can be applied. And where we use this, document their occurrences, their distribution, identify the habitats. Where do we want to go in and be effective? So really, think of it as a lens. This brings things into focus and say, we see indicators. This species may be present at this area. Maybe you want to go have a look. So for detection, help focus. We're dealing with big, big lakes. That's a lot of water to cover. And every agency has finite resources. So instead, hugely helpful to say, these are the areas you want to have a, a good look at. Or with this testing, this is low enough. Like we're not getting strong detections. 
pretty confident we don't have established populations yet. And in cases where a management response is appropriate, it's not just the early detection, but after a response effort has been mounted, have we been effective in removing them all? So the DNA would persist for a while, but if we're able to capture some fish, go back a few days later, particularly in a flowing system where the DNA should have washed through. Do we still see signs of the DNA present for that species? If so, we may need some follow-up sampling. So as I said earlier, it's basically a molecular smoke alarm and a way of clarifying where we want to be looking. But the hope is this will be one new tool in our toolkit. It's definitely not the only tool, but this can help enhance the effectiveness of our other tools. And through the collective effort, really hope that we, we manage to prevent Asian carp and their ilk from getting established in the Great Lakes. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, it was really a great uh, uh, presentation, very informative. We do have some time for questions, um, if you're able to answer a couple. So um, I have a few people have typed questions into the question box, and I can read those to you, and uh, I'll, let, I'll let you go ahead and answer. And if anybody else has questions, you want to just type them into the question box uh, on your screen, then we can go through them uh, one at a time and, and see if we, how much time we have for Chris to answer. So one question that was asked, um, Chris, have you developed multiple invasive markers that could detect multiple species with one water sample? Uh, there's two answers to that. Yes, is the short one. Uh, when we get a water sample looking for Asian carp, uh, we test for all four species and as well as doing some quality assurance tests. That's done on the same water sample and it takes us two tests to check for all four species. So uh, I didn't get into the detail, but uh, it is possible to test for several species in the same reaction. Um, basically, we use different probes for different species and test simultaneously. So that, that's one answer. Um, there is, people have been doing research on detecting all species that are present in the sample. So it's called community uh, metabarcoding or community eDNA. Uh, and it works. It relies on the same technology that has allowed uh, genome sequencing for a lot of different species. It's slightly different from the approach that I've described, where instead of uh, our normal surveillance, the markers we develop identify one species and one species only. So those markers are blind to everything else that's present. You can go in instead with markers, and we can still use these same target genes, but say instead of finding just big head carp or silver carp or species X, let's find everybody. The challenge is you then get all this information back on every species at once. And you basically need, uh, they call them next generation sequencers, that allow you to process hundreds of thousands of different pieces of information simultaneously. So with that, we can test for ideally all species that are present in one sample. The drawback is it's a huge flood of information and it's still expensive. So right now it's in the cost of thousands of dollars per sample. The costs are coming down, the technology is improving all the time, but it's not cost effective en enough yet for us to use it for surveillance. It's great for research, but um, I would not want to be going out and testing hundreds of samples using that approach. Okay. I guess the last thing to add to that answer, the DNA is in the water. It's the water sample itself that's critical. Once you have that, you can test for whatever species you're interested in. Great. Um, next question. Has any progress been made in determining if the sample came from a live or a dead organism? And then I, I, I guess also, in addition to that, can you tell how many might be in the area? Oof. Um, <clears throat> in my lab, no. Uh, we, as I mentioned early on, for how many, what really drives the amount of DNA present in the water is what's the amount 
of fish that's there. It's not the number of fish. So one fish could, one large fish could actually shed less DNA than many small ones. So it's a matter of biomass, not actual numbers. Um, and in terms of live or dead, there are ways to test for it. They're still very experimental. Uh, and it brings in other variables beyond what we're testing for at the moment. So the, the catch is uh, one dead carcass will be shedding a lot more DNA than several live individuals. So as well as biomass, it's, is it live or is it dead? And the difference is dead will shed a lot, and then as it decays, the signal drops. Live fish will be a more consistent or constant signal. And as I said, right now, the tests to tell between the two are still very experimental. OK, good to know. Um, another question, how can agencies collect and submit samples for analysis? Well, um, collecting the water itself is pretty simple. When we started our experiments, it was a mason jar on a pole. Uh, so getting the water is straightforward. The question is what to do with it then. Uh, what we do is filter the water we collect through very uh, fine pour paper filters. That the pore size on these filters is about one micron, or one millionth of a meter. Uh, and that's fine enough that the, the DNA and cells and sort of tissue debris are caught on that filter. Um, we've been relying on freezing those filters until we extract the DNA, but there are other methods for preserving it. But if an agency was wanting to get into it, uh, the first thing would be develop a plan. Good. Um, do you know how much it costs to actually test one of these samples? <laughs> Painfully so, yes. Um, it, it really varies depending on the method you're using. Um, for the protocols that my lab uses, the most expensive part is actually extracting the DNA. And from there, uh, because we've optimized methods and we have the appropriate equipment, it's costing us less than $5 per test for a given species. But that's after a lot of optimization, and that's not factoring in people time. And also, uh, to be confident of our results, we will typically test the same sample several times and see do we get repeated results. So the cost will vary quite a bit. OK, good to know. Um, the question, there's somebody asking a question about lentic systems, um, if you're familiar with those. Can you get similar types of signals uh, and sensitivities, uh, for, ins for example, number, time, that sort of thing? Yes. Um, so lentic is just the fancy word for water that isn't flowing. So basically in lakes or ponds. Uh, and it's very different from a flowing water system that some studies have shown the, the environmental DNA will last much longer uh, in standing water. So the ideal system for sampling is a pond. It's small, it's enclosed, uh, you don't have a lot of mixing or thermoclines like you do in lakes. So the DNA should be readily present. Pond, ponds are the ideal standing water or lentic system for sampling. Uh, Unfortunately, we're not concerned about many invasive species in ponds. Uh, lakes, you do get stratification and things like thermocline in the summer. So it's really, where is your eDNA present? The smartest thing for sampling is go to that source. So standing water sim uh, systems are simpler, and you should have the signal lasting longer as well. Um, so as far as epigenetic markers, um, are there some that might be helpful with identifying fish for their age? Um, so might be have to use nuclear nuclear DNA for that? That was a question someone's asking. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, one of the US agencies was looking into this because they wanted to be able to tell the age from the fish. If, if they got a detection, they wanted to find out more than just the species. Uh, there would be a lot of work to make that feasible, if it's feasible. What we know from humans is that at we, as we age, our chromosomes change. 
um, basically there's chromosome caps called telomeres. And every time your cells reproduce, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. So what was proposed um, by this agency is if they could capture the fish chromosomes, find the length of these telomeres, and from that, figure out the age of the fish. Um, I'm very skeptical that this is going to be feasible anytime soon. But for one thing, to be able to get enough quantities to have chromosomes and telomeres, the odds are you're pretty much on top of the fish. Collect the fish instead and just age it. You're unlikely to be able to do this from environmental DNA anytime soon. Great. Um, so question about water collection and sampling. So somebody's wondering, number one, if you're collecting the sample, um, what's the best way to pr uh, prolong the likelihood of finding DNA in the sample between getting it from the sampling site to the lab, and especially if it's really low quantities? Well, uh, what most people have been relying on is uh, keep it cold, because the studies so far have shown that most of the uh, DNA is actually still present in cells. So it's, it's not uh, DNA molecules floating freely in the water, but it's still bound up inside cells for the most part. And DNA is very sensitive to being broken down uh, by enzymes, and it's an ideal food for things like bacteria. But if you keep it cold, everything slows down. So it buys you a lot of time. So what we typically do is when samples are collected, they're immediately stored on ice and transported to somewhere where we can then do this filtration, trap the DNA, and then freeze it. There are potentially other ways of protecting the DNA in field samples, and uh, my lab has been doing some research on this. Uh, we don't have finalized protocols yet, but I'm expecting we will uh, before this time next year. So right now, the go-to method is keep it cold or else process it immediately to obtain the DNA from the samples. So, Chris, what happens if you get an eDNA detection in an area, but but and they go out and they monitor and they check for the fish, but then none are none are found? Um, what? How can you uh, determine whether there's actually fish there, or uh, you know what do you do then? That is one of the big challenges, and it's also a challenge because this is such a new technique that management agencies are typically used to actually handling fish. So they would expect to be able to capture them. But one difficulty is big head and silver carp in particular are very difficult to catch using normal sampling methods. So they don't go into gill nets very well. They tend to bounce off. They're sensitive to electrical currents. So electrofishing for them can be very challenging as well. And this is also a problem if you have one technique that is sensitive where another one is not. That which do you believe? If, if you have basically, I'm still, still working to find an analogy for this. If somebody comes up with a good one, I would love it. I tend to think of it as seeing in color versus black and white. Um, if one method is more sensitive than another, then it should be detectable with the one and not the less sensitive one. But this is also why it, it was so important to validate the tools before launching out and using them, is you want to be able to be confident of the result. So if my lab gets a positive detection or potential positive, we first retest it, validate it, that it is true, true DNA from the species we're looking for and not a contaminant or a false positive. The key is to get this quickly, send it back, the information back out. So it, ideally within two to three days of when the sample was collected, so people can go and look. One big challenge is fish move. So if we detect them at one location and then basically call in the cavalry and there's netting and electrofishing there and they don't get anything, it may be because the fish have simply moved. It may be they're present and they can't be captured with those methods. Uh, or it would also be possible that this is a non-living source so there's no live fish to capture. Okay. 
Um, in following all the grass carp sightings that, um, and actual findings that uh, happened this last summer in the Toronto Harbour and uh, surrounding areas, um, I know that you guys, in, in conjunction with uh, DFO, uh, went and did a lot of monitoring in that area and uh, checked to find and you know found as many fish as you think that, that were available to be found. Um, but going forward with that, is the monitoring for eDNA in those areas going to change? Have you uh, changed how you're looking at those areas north of there, south of there, um, up into the tributaries and streams coming through the, into that uh, lake area? Um, I don't actually have an answer for that because those the grass carp in Toronto Harbour um, came as a bit of a rude surprise to everybody. And it was actually thanks to the Toronto Region Conservation Authority that they were first detected. And then uh, DFO and MNRF joined in to make sort of a multiple collaborative effort. But our monitoring efforts for Asian carp had been concentrated in Lake Erie and its tributaries because that was where the, the risk assessment identified this was the highest risk area. So until last summer, there was not any environmental DNA sampling in Lake Ontario at least on the Ontario side. And with those occurrences last summer, um, I think it's reasonable to expect that there's going to be interest in doing that. Uh, I don't know yet uh, whether or not there will be a monitoring effort expanded to Lake Ontario or not. If there is, I'm expecting my lab will be asked to help out and will certainly be willing to. Excellent. Um, we have one comment in here. Someone is asking um, if someone sees invasive plant colonies or um, for that matter, I'll just say if anyone finds or suspects seeing anything that's an invading species, whether it's plant or fish or, or anything of that description, um, up on your screen is the invading species hotline. There's a phone number, a website, you can report it there and it'll take you to a link where you can download um, EdMaps to your phone and you can actually um, report the invading species right on, on your phone. Um, I just, uh, we're out of time now and I'd just like to say thank you to Dr. Wilson for your wonderful presentation about environmental DNA and its use in detecting Asian carps in Canadian waters. Um, I also encourage everyone to please visit our website at asiancarp.ca for more information about Asian carps and announcements about future webinars. We have another webinar coming up on February 18th and it's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Becky Cudmore will be um, post, or perform, presenting this webinar and Becky's from Fisheries and Oceans Canada Asian Carp Program. Uh, she's the manager of that program and she'll be giving an update on what activities are being done within that program and to help prevent the introduction and establishment of Asian carps in the Great Lakes. Becky's uh, the webinar registration link will follow uh, by email to those who are on this webinar today within the next hour and you'll be able to sign up for that uh, following Chris's webinar. So I hope you all enjoyed the webinar. Uh, have a great day and hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you again, Chris. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.